So this is an amazing event, and this year looks to be no different. We're super honored to be a part of it. Um, so I'm Andrew Heumann. Uh, and I'm Brian Ringley. Uh, we're both senior researchers at WeWork. And today what we want to talk about is kind of a three-part uh, sort of organization, starting with a little bit of uh, sort of exploration of what are the kind of models of working with software that sort of currently exist in AEC. Um, we'll move on to some kind of speculative requirements for near future software, the things that we think the software industry really needs to address in order to kind of uh, be ready for the challenges that are coming. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some kind of general recommendations about how AEC firms and practitioners can kind of prepare themselves for these near futures. And bear in mind, this was before we saw Jonathan and Ben speak, yeah. <laughs> so I think they've already solved a number of the problems we'll be bringing up. Yeah. So, to start with models, I'll let you... Yeah, um, one of the things we're kind of continuously railing against, for a couple of reasons, is the myth of the monoplatform. Um, I think there are a lot of kind of good and understandable reasons why people think that one piece of software should be able to kind of do everything for them. Um, whether it's from kind of their comfort zone in that app. Uh, but there are a number of reasons why that's uh, impractical and, and also potentially kind of uh, dangerous um, from our kind of app competition level. Because realistically, the things that we do as sort of practitioners span this extremely wide gamut. And even if a software platform can tackle a fair number of these, it's not going to do all of them well. This is just the reality. No software developer can ever possibly account for all of these use cases in one package. And I still stand pretty firm that you know Rhino is a great design tool, but it fails in a lot of ways when it comes to documentation. Revit is a okay documentation tool, but it fails in a lot of ways when it comes to design. Um, so it's really, it's kind of a cultural issue of getting people to not kind of get in the mindset of, oh, I need to get trained and become good at a particular platform, which then kind of dictates the way I practice, but I need to develop a critical attitude toward using platforms in combination. And so the sort of the landscape, I think, for a long time, and I think this is really the way that practice looks even today in a lot of firms, is all about this kind of model of file-based exchange. And you're just, you know, you're, you're exporting this, you're importing this, you're saving this, you're saving that. Um, and, you know, this is messy. It's very hard to kind of manage and track changes. You've got different versions of different things, and the rendering shows one facade, but the model shows another one, and it's, um, it's messy. But it is, you know, it does speak to this reality that different software packages do different things well, and you need to sort of rely on various packages for their strengths. Yeah, and inevitably there's data loss between those steps. The model schemas are different. They don't play nicely together. Uh, and often you're sending kind of entire files as opposed to curating the bits of data that are critical to send. And so I think the sort of next step in that evolution um, was really kind of data-based exchange, where rather than focusing on files, it was about saying, what is the information that I need to get from one platform to another? I think TTX was actually one of the first to do this really well. There have been a number of other plugins operating in Grasshopper or in uh, Revit or in Dynamo that have kind of handled some of these mechanisms of exchange. And the paradigm has shifted to one being kind of Revit element based, which was a kind of game of diminishing returns. Developers kind of had to do their best guess at like how much time they could put into uh, offering tools for particular element types. Um, and you can see there's kind of a scattering of offerings and it's also just Revit. So we're now defining kind of data exchange by what can be defined in Revit. Um, and then moving into a paradigm of kind of lower level uh, data type or geometry type exchanges, um, which made things a lot more fluid and custom, kind of freed up the way you could send data. And then you could rely on the Revit API, usually through tools like Dynamo, to then build your elements up on the Revit side. And then um, this kind of all led to uh, kind of Flux coming in and saying, well, I can kind of take it a step further and we're just gonna do something super generic and like anything now counts as data. If you wanna serialize an image, that's data. If you wanna send a curve, that's data. If you wanna send a Revit element, that's data. And then presumably with their SDK, although it's you know a little bit of work here, um, anything that has an API can be kind of connected into. 
And so I think there are totally uh, sort of a range of really different attitudes toward this that are all kind of addressing different sides of the same problem. There's Flux, there's Speckle, there's Constru, which are all operating in this way of kind of getting just the data you need from one place into the place where you need it, um, as well as kind of layering new features and capabilities on top of that. And I think that's the next stage of this evolution, is that once you've set up a kind of baseline mechanism for getting data to and from platforms, um, it starts to actually transform the nature of what it is into, and especially when the web and the cloud are the mechanism by which this is done, um, you can actually start to think of these things as more than just data from place to place, but about locating a platform for apps or web-based services. Ben talked about sort of engineering as a web service, and we think this is kind of the next stage in that evolution that's just kind of beginning to emerge. This also kind of reintroduces the idea of user interface and user interaction. So something that was a little bit problematic about the progression in the previous slides um, as these kind of data exchange apps got better and better for experts they got more and more alienating for the general design population so you kind of had this body of like you know 0.001 percent of users in AEC that were like this is awesome my life is easier but I don't think it was doing a lot of favors for the industry overall there's another aspect of this that I think is really interesting, which is when you start to see firms themselves, AEC practitioners, taking their knowledge and turning these into APIs, turning them into web services, making their intelligence and the things that they bring to a design practice. This is Burrow Happold's Smart Space Analyzer um, running on the pl Flux platform. Um, but now this is something that, you know, from any platform, I can now send my data, tie into it, get analysis, retrieve those results, and bring them back into my model. And I think that you know the, the stuff that TT's groups are doing, that Constru is doing, is also in a certain way about kind of taking this disciplinary intelligence and encoding it as kind of applications or APIs. Um, we also see bigger software companies moving towards this same idea, starting with kind of Forge, Forge's APIs, which is sort of evolving into the project quantum thing that Autodesk has been working on. Um, where you know, it really is about these kind of micro apps that are hyper-targeted to kind of specific use cases. So whether it's you know, uh, environmental performance or uh, facade design, you know, rather than having the app that does it all, you just have a constellation of interconnected uh, services and apps that can kind of communicate back and forth. And we're also kind of seeing a flip of the paradigm from I have data that I'm gonna try to shove through a bunch of different models to the idea that I have this kind of holistic model that is a collection of platform-based models, but the overall idea of the building project is encapsulated on the web and is actually moving through um, these different algorithms. So we want to move from this to speculate on a few kind of ideas that maybe point at some requirements for kind of the continued evolution of software. So, one of the big things, this is an example from Envelope City, where they're basically, they've created, they were a spin-off from Shop. They were creating this mechanism to basically select a parcel and sort of get all of the data back, uh, sort of figure out the zoning envelope that you can do on the basis of the data that they've collected. And I think that this is another example where it's about kind of turning knowledge into services or algorithms or APIs that you can start to tap into. Um, and also making it accessible, like Brian mentioned, via a sort of user-friendly web interface. And it's, it's also just firms and practitioners kind of taking control of their own needs, becoming in-house software developers, as you've seen from the prior two presentations as well, and not kind of sitting on our thumbs and waiting for um, large software companies to kind of answer our tickets. So at WeWork, we're experimenting with this too. We're building our own APIs. This is work by my colleagues on the research team, Carlo Bailey and Carl Anderson, to basically create an API that handles automatic layout of desks. So they've looked at our fleet of buildings, and they've written an API where you send it a polygon, and it can spit back a desk layout so that we can you know, sort of streamline many of these more tedious design processes. Another kind of critical component of this is that the software that we work with has to be sort of equally accessible by a human user and a sort of programmatic access. So this, this image is maybe a little obscure. This is a project I did that was about automating the Revit sample house. Um, but essentially was looking at probing the limits of what was automatable 
currently in a platform like Revit? And the answer is you can get somewhere, you can make something that sort of vaguely resembles a house, but there's a lot that's missing. There's a lot that isn't, simply isn't accessible. You know, you can't make a sketch-based stair with the API. You can't make a ceiling. So the idea that everything you can do as a user, you should be able to do as well as a coder. Yeah, and it, this, is, this is the basic Revit sample model. So bear in mind that this is supposed to be the bare minimum that anyone working in building, informa uh, building information modeling can achieve. Therefore, the fact that it's not completely exposed through the API, I think, is uh, perhaps a failure on the part of software developers. But now moving forward, we say everything has to be exposed through the API. And also to touch again on this idea of the challenge of kind of interoperability in general is everything has to be accessed programmatically. I think that's easy to understand in terms of like, OK, well, Revit has the API in Dynamo, and Grasshopper, uh, Rhino has Rhino Common and Grasshopper. So you're not just connecting your primary platforms, you're also connecting to these kind of other programmatic layers on top of it. And then if you go into something like, say, Fusion 360 that has like a weird Python shell thingy, like how does, how does that work? So the challenge is actually pretty immense to get everything to speak together. And you know, this also speaks to the need for good API design. Um, I, I think that on the screen, there are, there's an example of a good API and an example of maybe a poorly designed API, and I won't tell you which one I think is which. Um, but I think that there's a lot to be said for sort of really API first development and eating your own dog food as a software developer, where you build the interfaces that you expect someone writing for your platform to use, and you use them yourself in developing new features and uh, you know, kind of new capabilities of your software. There's also this kind of idea that, you know, we've seen visual programming grow from something where, you know, you're kind of noodling over here with Grasshopper as a student into really a kind of mature platform for doing certain kinds of software development. And I think that trajectory will continue. And the idea of kind of parity between textual coding and visual programming is, is I think, something that software platforms will need to account for as well. Dynamo has this ability to turn its node graph into textual code. Um, but it's about more than that. It's also about bringing concepts and paradigms from kind of software architecture to the visual programming space. So, Mm -hmm. what, this, what this allows for is essentially you have different kind of layers in your program, just like you would when you're compiling uh, regular code, where you'd have a UI layer, a kind of business logic layer that does the main geometry stuff, and then maybe some display layers and some output layers. And again, kind of going back to the point that everything should be parametric, this is a parametric UI made with the same kind of guts uh, that's controlling the parametric business logic. And for those of you in our extremely, perhaps overwhelming and confusing workshop yesterday, uh, <laughs> where we're talking about all these different paradigms, um, also utilizing MetaHopper to make parametric software platforms parametrically accessible. So like actually kind of another layer of logic in that hierarchy. One of the other things we see in kind of current software, Revit is a great example of this, where there are kind of different scales of intelligence, different scales of intelligent behavior. So a parametric family is really good about setting up kind of the controls over a single object, setting up a kind of variable object. But then there's another level of intelligence about how that object might interact with its context, a kind of situational intelligence. And then uh, the kind of governing model, this is an example of a, of a project that uh, Brian worked on at Woods Bagot that essentially built a, a sort of complete interface for doing a huge range of design studies. Yeah, so you have these skills of intelligence, you have like the really smart object that kind of knows what it can do but is completely unaware of its neighbors, then you can kind of make it, a, it aware of its context. I think Dynamo is a great example of that, making Revit elements kind of aware of and reactive to one another. Um, but then you kind of inevitably uh, end up, at least in my experience, building lots of different scripts to do for different things across like Dynamo and Flux and Grasshopper and kind of whatever. Um, and we actually got interested uh, in what is like the layer over top of all of those things. Because if you use something like Flux or Constru or Speckle as a means to use kind of data keys to send information kind of to a central web repository and then back out to your kind of ecosystem of scripts, is there any way to track that relationship? Um, and it turns out sort of. 
Uh, so this was something that uh, Andrew helped me with because I had a large collection of scripts. Also built with, shout out to Maria Nikolovsky in the back <laughs> of the shop. This was something we did together at Woods Baggett, uh, where we were kind of tracking. We had, uh, we had kind of an initial data export. Actually, I'll back up. What is this? <laughs> um, every, every rectangle is a script, um, primarily visual programming. So the green ones are grasshopper scripts or grasshopper files or definitions, and the gray ones are dynamo scripts or graphs or definitions. The light blue is, is one flux definition and the dark blue is like the initial kind of data set out of the base Revit model. And what this is actually showing is any data key coming in, and a data key could be like column center line, uh, column ID, um, window height, something like that, and ADA, any data key going out, and then this is just wiring up all of those relationships. This was actually kind of an incredible experience because first of all, it was the first time we had seen it, and it kind of made sense. Oh yeah, there's an initial data push out of Revit. I do the bulk of the work in Grasshopper, which is just more lightweight and faster, and then I end with a bunch of kind of element instantiations using Dynamo on the right, and then there's some weird like floating islands of maybe some side things I did. Um, but it was also an amazing QAQC tool. We found like, oh, there are like a couple misspellings because we see uh, wires that haven't been attached. And the funny thing about this is we used visual programming to get all of the data key relationships from our Grasshopper and Dynamo file directories. We used visual programming to draw the graph relationship. And then we used Doodlebug, I think, yeah. to actually grab the outlines of the diagram we made in a visual programming platform to make a nice vector drawing in Illustrator. This, this baby is beautiful. <laughs> um, it's all visual programming. Um, so another requirement I think for future software is, um, I came up with this phrase and I'm very proud of it, machine readable <laughs> deliverables. But this is just the general idea of this idea of a model driven delivery. We have all this data, da da da, but we still make drawings. Like, no, like nothing has changed, let's be honest. Um, but uh, people are starting to do these little side things. Like we, we've seen images of like construction rovers and drones and those are kind of operating off of model data. So like there are these like little bits and pieces um, so this would favor um, kind of direct NC output, machine instructions, as opposed to documents. BIM, def I shouldn't have used FIM because FIM is now like fabrication information modeling, facility. Uh, where you? Forensic. Forensics, yeah. like there's like too many, yeah. too many F things. But just the idea of like direct to fab over handing over, like here's my Revit model to some kind of like fabricator or sub and they're just gonna like trace AutoCAD over top of my 3D and it's like invalidates the entire process. Um, uh, thinking about the production of architecture in terms of automated manufacturing lines over in situ construction or traditional prefab and on and on uh, into like supply chain logistics and on-site operations. Um, this is easy enough to kind of envision as an academic project. So these are a couple of shots of work from my seminars at Pratt as well as those of my, our research done with my colleague Robert Cervellioni. Um, so visual programming is kind of a nice tool because it allows for the convergence of a lot of disciplinary knowledge into kind of one quick script. So this is a relatively like simplistic operation of like, I'm gonna do a form finding exercise, I'm going to rationalize it, do a little bit of gravity load, da 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 da, and optimize my tooling, and at the end of the day, I can uh, directly output rapid code, which drives an ABB industrial robotic arm. And the point of this is, is if I go all the way upstream and I make any design change, in real time, um, a few milliseconds, I get new machine code. Um, so it's easy kind of in the context of academia to prove that concept out, but we're typically working with more than a single robotic arm. So there has been some interesting uh, research, I think, into the idea of machine networks that are at least partially model driven. And again, the point here is that our model should really directly facilitate this kind of thing. So uh, MX3D is doing kind of a 3D printed bridge where the robot is also building its own track, which is pretty tough, um, which extends its build envelope. Uh, Stuttgart is doing uh, research into using ROS, the robot operating system, to connect drones to robotic arms, again, to expand that build envelope. And then on to uh, construction sites and factory floors. So uh, Nlink and Alive.ai are doing interesting things with robots that consume model data either to punch holes in a ceiling, which is a tough thing for a human to do, 
um, or to just kind of continuously monitor a construction site for safety and QA. Um, and our model should also output things that kind of interface well with modular construction and with digital fabrication, um, even to go so far as to lay out shop floors uh, based on our model information. One additional requirement is this idea of being able to accommodate treating the projects that we work on as data in a larger field of work. So this is one we work floor plate, this is another, this is another, but they really become valuable to us when we kind of conceive of them as an entire data set. And so where we're able to kind of programmatically query not just individual models, but entire sets of models and understand the relationships between them. Obviously, WeWork has kind of a specific spatial product that we work on many times over, but I think this is applicable to more traditional architecture firms and engineering firms. I think there's a lot to be learned from kind of understanding the scope of your work and interrogating it computationally. Some of the work that TT has done around machine learning, I think, kind of points to some pretty interesting consequences of this. So what I think a lot of this points to is this idea of kind of the, the oncoming reality of automation. So we're kind of moving rightward on this graph in our practices from kind of tedious manual stuff towards a sort of version of automation. And if we flip this axis and look at it against time, this is kind of my super vague prediction about kind of the trajectories of things. I think the, the space of possible automation is accelerating. We're moving towards this kind of asymptotic line of full automation. I think we're a really long way from that, but we will we'll never kind of reach it. I think it's that law of diminishing returns that is implied by this asymptote. Um, but I think maybe more important is the bottom threshold of kind of what's practical. And what I mean by that is like, the line below which it's no longer feasible or practical to work in a manual way. So the more we are able to automate, the less it's going to be realistic or reasonable or feasible to not automate, to not do things in an intelligent or uh, sort of programmatic way. And we may kind of be at the end of the era where we have the luxury of the choice. I think we're starting to move into new territory where it simply won't be an option to not automate certain things. That has a lot of implications for how we prepare ourselves as an industry. An example that's often been cited for this is the idea of self-driving cars and the reduction of deaths and insurance industries lobbying to actually change legislation. It will be illegal to drive your own car. So I think we're constantly thinking of this stuff in terms of like, it's my choice whether I want to engage. We may be at the end of that. So just to wrap up a couple kind of pretty loose and vague recommendations about what we as practitioners can be doing in order to kind of prepare for this. One that's really broad is just the idea of scaling up. Being here, attending a hackathon, great way to start. Um, you know, I think there are so many really critical tech stacks that are emerging. I think understanding cloud technology. I mean, first of all, if, if you don't have kind of coders in your practice, then you're already behind. I expect most folks who are attending an event like this are already thinking that way. Um, but you know, being able to write your own APIs as you know, TT is doing, as we're doing at WeWork, I think is a really kind of critical skill that needs to grow within all of our organizations. Yeah, and I think we've, we've been preaching this for a long time, and sometimes we get feedback like, well, this is, this is impractical for, for my type of firm. And, I think you need to think about why that is, and that's kind of like an inner soul-searching industry question. Uh, why is it impractical for us to do these things, and um, who else is going to do them before we do? And another one that probably seems a little obvious is you know, the idea of being ready to break out of silos and make partnerships between established professionals with tons of experience in the things that we do day to day and you know maybe younger employees who have a coding background or have some experience in this it's really critical that these 
sort of kinds of employees are talking to each other and exchanging ideas. If, you know, if you're just working in your old school way, you're, you know, kind of leading towards irrelevance. If you're a coder who doesn't understand the kind of fundamentals of the practice, then you're also in trouble. And machine learning is just the application of algorithms to statistics and data. All of that data came from people and their experience. So there's a very obvious kind of mixed zone here between people who specialize in a kind of algorithmic approach and people who um, just have a lot of knowledge in their heads. And another aspect of this that goes beyond sort of experienced and junior is kind of just cross-disciplinarity. I feel really lucky to be a part of this team at WeWork where, you know, we have some architectural knowledge, but we've also got, you know, a master's of an earth and environmental sciences, PhD in social psychology, a PhD in mathematical biology and statistics and cellular biology. Um, I honestly don't know how I wound up on this team. Um, but it's like the, the kinds of questions that people external to the industry will ask you about the industry and the practices that we perform, those are the places where some of the most innovative and kind of powerful questions and insights come. I actually also enjoy being like the least educated person. <laughs> it's been fun. So I think this is probably our last recommendation. Um, one tendency that I see, this is maybe especially bad in architecture, um, is that we have this tendency to make these claims about what it is architecture does, what the value of it is, or what it's capable of producing, but we never really, and there are exceptions, but in general, we're not very good at measuring that impact, at performing post-occupancy evaluations, at evaluating whether or not the predictions that we made were valid. So this is another WeWork project. Um, where we looked at kind of actu actual occupation and then based on a series of variables, humans were invited to kind of make a prediction about what the real occupation of these spaces would be. And then we compared that to a kind of statistical regression's own predictions. Um, and the computer was actually better at looking at the space of the data um, making an evaluation about what, how, how well these spaces were going to be occupied. Um, but this, would, this is only valid and only possible because we've been able to actually measure these things in the first place. You can't make these valid predictions if you don't have the data. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, architects are kind of faced with like a double-edged sword here where it's like your, your product is highly inconsistent. You typically don't have a well-constrained design space. And for a number of reasons, not all of them the fault of the firm or even the industry, we often don't measure things. So you're like a factory that makes a different thing every day but never asks anyone how well the thing you made yesterday <laughs> worked. So that, that seems a little like, it seems a little strange. Yeah. So I think that's it for our, uh, our suggestions. I think uh, go, go to the hackathon. It'll be a, a good way to kind of level up on a lot of these issues. And uh, we're excited to to come back next year and see how far we've moved along these trajectories. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.